First Timothy chapter 1. I'll begin by reading the whole chapter. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in, the, in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all expect, acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Talking today about naming names. Naming names. <clears throat> now here, Paul is addressing Timothy specifically. Paul the elder is addressing a younger preacher. And he, he tells him to abide still at Ephesus. He gives him his locality of where he's going to be working. Hey, stay put in Ephesus. This is the charge I give thee. And throughout this whole uh, letter that he gives to Timothy, he uses phrases like charge some or, or command and teach. Uh, it's, it's, it's clear that Timothy is taking upon the role of a pastor or bishop at this time. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we see that Timothy's charge is one of a shepherd. He is leading people, he is guiding people with his own words, right? He's, he's presenting to people what they ought to do and how they ought to live, and, and he's doing it by the word of God, and he's doing it with, with verbiage that, that indicates a forcefulness. Or he says, command. He says, preach, be instant. Instant. Be, be ready to preach these things. In season, out of season, popular or not, you got to proclaim this message. Charge, command, teach, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Have long suffering and long draw out with people. Give them long exhortations, long dissertations, long reproof, long rebuke in order that they would come to the truths that you are presenting them with, the doctrine that they need to understand. In 1 Timothy 1.18, there, the Bible 
brings it to um, an, an analogy of a war. He says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So Timothy, as he was going to present the truth, had even received the same truth. Prophecies are preaching that went before on him, and in his behalf, he is now to go with them and use them in order that he might as well war a good warfare. He is charged to war, but it comes with this warning. It says in verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. So this is continuing on with what he needs to do. He needs to fight this fight. He needs to war this good warfare, holding faith, holding a good conscience at the same time, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Timothy, don't end up like these. You need to hold faith, have that good conscience, in order that you might not make shipwreck. Of whom, verse 20, is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So here, the men in particular that have been falling away, that have been made shipwreck concerning the faith, are named, and it's here plainly in black and white in the scriptures, names are named, and it goes throughout all eternity in the word of God, and we have it, we can behold it today. And yet some today, they say, well, is this even allowed? Is this, is this biblical? Is this okay? What Paul is doing here? How he, how he said, hey, there's, there's some that concerning the faith have made shipwreck. Hymenaeus and Alexander specifically, these ones are being named. Is this okay? Is this biblical? Is this right for us to do? We see, though, Paul continues in this same vein. He didn't just drop this one time and leave it there. Paul continues time and time again in his instructions to a preacher that is under his tutelage. He says, hey, name the names. Not specifically, but by his own example. He's charging Timothy to war. He's charging him that he continues in the faith. And he's saying there's some that have not done that. He's their names. And he continues as he goes through in dealings with and in teaching of Timothy to do the same thing. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Timothy 2, and verse 14. It says, Of these things, put them, the people he's teaching, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the ears. He says to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. More instruction given to Timothy. And then he doesn't just change gears and go on to some other topic. This is in the same line. Timothy, you're charging some. Timothy, you're preaching to some. Timothy, you're encouraging some. Timothy, you don't want to subvert the hearers. You don't want words of no profit in your church. So charge these people. Put them into remembrance to understand these things. Study in order that you have the ammunition to present these things to them. And in the same breath he says, but... Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. Don't use profane and vain babblings in your preaching and in your teaching, he says, because this will just increase the issue. This will just increase the whole uh, disaster that's before you unto more ungodliness. This is in verse 17. And their word will eat as doth the canker, or as doth the cancer, the words of the subverting hearers, the words of those that hear the words but don't follow after those things. Their word will eat as doth the cancer. You need to deal with them specifically, and you need to deal with them appropriately. And then again he says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The bottom line of what he's looking for is that everyone who names the name of Christ departs from iniquity. What's standing in his way is the profane and vain babblings of some here that are subverting the hearers, subverting other people in the church, subverting those that would receive the, the message, would receive the truths, would rather they would increase into more godliness, but when subversion enters in by profane and vain babblings, they're at risk of going to more ungodliness, which is described as a canker or as a cancer within the body that Timothy's being instructed to lead. 
Hymenius here and Philetus are brought again, named specifically as the problem. Names are named. And here in black and white, we have it recorded. This will last forever throughout all eternity. The word of God is established and sure and does not fade away. And yet, even still, we will have those within our, our immediate area, within our uh, greater context of North America, wherever they would be, we have those that would um, criticize those that name names, criticize those that call to attention specific people and their sins. We would have those other preachers who would say that if you do those things on social media or in the pulpits, you deserve to be chastened. You're, you're criticized for doing that thing. Yet, we have an example here of the Apostle Paul doing the same. I'm talking today about naming names. <clears throat> and even myself, if anybody knows, I got into a little bit of trouble with this when I named a preacher Calvin Allen, an evangelist, right? It got me into trouble with the old IFB mafia. I raffled a little tail feathers and, 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 and it caused hurt. It was one of the main things, the main problems that was brought up, accusation against me, was that I, I named names. <laughs> but it's biblical, and I believe that. I'm going to present that a little bit further. Naming names is what I'm talking about here. Now, the charge that they will make regarding naming names is, is, is twofold in most cases. First, they will say it is causing unnecessary divisions. It is causing divisions in the body, and I don't know what, what body they believe in, because when I, when I mentioned the names, nobody here got in trouble, or nobody here got, got mad at Brother Josh for doing such. <clears throat> they say it's causing divisions, but in the context of when it was done by Paul, he said there were some that did him much evil. There were some that did him much harm. And if you could, turn over to 2 Timothy 4 and verse 14. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 14, it says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our works. He is calling to Timothy's attention a man that greatly withstood him, and he says, Timothy, you need to be aware of this guy also. And this is what is happening here, and this is why he is even naming the name Alexander the coppersmith. He's saying, hey, someone did me much evil. You should be aware also because they will do the same to you. It's very likely because this is the character that we're dealing with. So causing divisions then, in this case, I would think that's a good thing. If I'm dividing from somebody that's going to, that did my friend much evil, and is potentially gonna do me much evil, I would say the best thing that I could do would be to divide, to separate, to remove myself from that person. So charging that naming names is wrong because you create division. Naming names is exactly doing what it's supposed to do and that it created the division. You're being warned about an impending danger. The next charge that I've heard is that you should go to your brother privately. Go to Matthew chapter 18. I don't know if you've heard this before, but quite often when it comes to, to naming names, whether you're calling out somebody on the internet or whether you're, you're naming a local preacher or, or somebody um, who's affecting your ministry or some, someone that crept in unawares, whatever, so be, they'll say that, hey, you should go to your brother privately. Matthew chapter 18 is the context that they're trying to bring up. In Matthew chapter 18, and in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So who are we talking about here? We're saying, hey, if thy brother, so a personal relationship, a singular pronoun, if thy brother specifically Jesus is talking about, if thy brother shall trespass or cross a line, you've said, hey, this is the rule, I'm trespassing, I've caused offense to the line that you've put up, if thy brother, personal, shall trespass against thee, specifically again to the person that's being trespassed against, if he shall do that, go and tell him his fault, again, that's the brother's fault, between thee and him alone. Okay? If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. What's that saying? That's saying, if somebody personally offends you and you alone, yeah. go to him privately, explain your offense. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. You've reconciled. You've come together on that point and you can move on from there. You, 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 you've, you've talked it out. Okay, that was a disagreement. Hey, I was wrong. We've gained 
a brother. We're, we're now on the same page again. Sorry I hurt you. No problem. You're forgiven, right? That's what it's talking about. Hey, if you trespass against your brother. And the other illustration is if, if I just had, had my hand here, right, and, and, and Brother Rob came and he wanted to lean on the pulpit and he put his hand here, whoa, the immediate thing would be for not me to go and tell everybody in the world that Brother Rob touched my hand. It would just be to go, hey, man, you touched my hand. Sorry. It's a, it's a quick resolution to an immediate offense, right? Obviously, that's a silly illustration, right? I'm not going to be so offended if he just brushes my hand on the pulpit. But if it was something where there was a trespass, this is my rule, this is my bubble, he touched it, okay? I'm going to say, hey, man, don't do that. He's going to say, I'm sorry. We've, we've resolved it according to Matthew chapter 18. It continues on, though, and says in verse 16, But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man or a publican. So the first verse is what everybody is saying, that instead of naming the name in public, that we should do, okay? And I agree, if this is a trespass and a simple thing like, hey, don't touch my hand, Rob trespasses, we can correct it right away. I don't need to tell the whole world that that happened, that he stepped on my toe. I don't need to tell them, I can resolve that right away. But what this continues down on and will give us a more clear understanding of the context is that if he doesn't hear, you bring others with, you explain the offense. Again, it's kind of a little bit of a private thing. And if that doesn't work, you tell it to the church, and he's rejected as a he's a man or a Republican because he's just got an unrepentant heart. Whether the trespass is huge or it's little, we don't really know. It's probably a little bit bigger of a fault than just touching the guy's hand because it's something that there would be division over it. But regardless, it's a step-by-step-by-step -step -step plan in order to resolve issues. And where does it say in verse 17? Tell it unto the church. If you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto these a heathen man and a publican. It's the context of a local body, a local assembly, a locality of people that are resolving trespasses as they come up. And the trespass is always going to be this tipping scale. Something might offend me a little bit more than it might offend you. You've got your own degree of trespass. And that's why when you're trespass, you go to that person perfectly because, or privately because it could be where, hey, I'm just overreacting. Hey, man, that was, really, that was really weird. That really offended me when you crossed my bubble and touched my hand. Oh, man, I didn't mean to. That was just an overreaction. Oh, really? You weren't doing that on purpose? Okay, I misread the situation. That makes sense. All right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we can resolve it, right? You see how there's a trespass made and it's resolved quickly and it was all just based on a scale of what offended me and we were able to resolve it in a, in a, civil, in a civil fashion. <clears throat> but it was always my offense. You know what I could have done also? If I was offended, I could have just said, you know what, he probably didn't mean to. He's forgiven, I'm gonna just let it go. I could have done that on my own. This is not something that if I was to just bury it and just say, you know what, forget it. It's not a big deal. He didn't mean to do that. Coming from all sorts of offenses that can happen in the church body. The, the spiritual one should do that, by the way. Should just, you know, something minor happened. Somebody looked at me funny. They didn't shake my hand at church. Like, they're ignoring me. Like, a lot of those things can be just attributed to our own flesh and our own pride welling up. Most of the time, we can just say, okay, I'm probably acting silly. I don't need to go to that person and explain to them that they need to make sure that they shake my hand every Sunday in church. Otherwise, I'll be offended. No, you need to resolve some of those things in your own heart and just let them go. But if there's a trespass worthy enough that you need to deal with and you just can't let it go, okay, go to that person one on one, settle it. There's probably a misunderstanding 99.9% .9 of the time. Same thing with me. If I offend you, hey, just come to me in private after you've thought long and hard of maybe I'm just overreacting. No, 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 I, I'm not. I need to go to Brother Josh. Come to Brother Josh in person and just we'll see if we can resolve it. I'm not intending to offend anybody in here, and neither are most people in here. I think most of us do not want to be offended nor offend others. So this is the pattern that Matthew chapter 18 is given. This is not what is being talked about when it talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander, the coppersmith. This is not what's being discussed when it talks about these that are doing much harm, not just to me, but to others who they're going to come into contact with. And this is the difference. This is not, then, a, 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 a statement being made or a, or a plan being given to anything but the context of individuals in a local church. This is not 
a, a false prophet who's out there publicly, week after week, preaching to millions, influencing millions of people with their lies publicly. This is not saying, hey, i got to go to him because he's offended me in particular. He is, he is hurting and harming and offending many people. Do you see how it's a bigger scale? It's beyond what the church says, so it's even breaking the rule of the context of what Matthew chapter 18 says. It's not affecting specifically his actions, my church, my body here that I assemble with, right? <clears throat> this is not talking about, you know, a, a, a pervert who's harming kids, who, who's a, a, going into churches and, and, and molesting and doing all sorts of gross things, and then being moved around like he's some Catholic priest from church to church to church, covering up the sins. This, this is not what it's talking about, going to him privately to settle our disputes. He hasn't offended me. Only his actions are offending me because, because they're wicked, and I feel not for myself and the offense that I've taken, but I feel for the offense those that he has harmed and the ones that he will harm next. You see the difference? This is also not talking about someone who's threatening physical violence, who's actually trying to attack people within my realm in a physical way. This isn't, this isn't what we're dealing with when we look at Matthew chapter 18. We're dealing with a trespass. We're just dealing with a fault, with just a harm, with just most of the time just a whoopsie, I didn't mean to hurt you, but I did, right? Those kind of avenues. <clears throat> When I am offended as a believer, okay, in the context of Matthew chapter 18, when I am offended, I have the liberty, I have the freedom to take the knock, to, to, take, to take the hurt. I can, I can either own it and just say, well, I forget it, I forgive, I, I forgive them, let it go. Or I have the ability and the liberty from the scriptures to go and to seek reconciliation so that my conscience can be clear and I can know that the brother either did it on purpose or he didn't. We can resolve this thing and it can be settled. I have the liberty of that, but that's me personally. When others are at risk, I do not have the liberty to keep those things in. I don't have the liberty to just own that hurt of the child that's going to be hurt. Just own that hurt of, of somebody that's going to be attacked violently. <clears throat> I'm not at liberty to keep those things private if I'm made privy to a situation. I must get it out there. I must speak up. And who are we talking about specifically? Well, recently, and the most recent one that comes to my mind, is this guy Cameron Giovanelli, okay? There's a preacher down in the States in Florida, <clears throat> and he is guilty of, pled guilty to, statutory rape of a minor while he was a pastor at a church. He pled guilty to this. He was facing like 78 years in prison for what he had did, <clears throat> what was verified that he did. And instead of facing that, he pled guilty to the act, and they gave him 90 days in prison. And after 90 days, he'll be out on, on bail and probation for about five years. And over that time, <clears throat> when all this was coming to be, there was buddies of his in the old IFB church, big names, Tom and Greg Neal, Bob Gray Sr., Alan Demelli, and Jack Treber, who were harboring this man along the way, knowing the accusations, knowing that they were verified, they continued to say, oh, be gracious to him, oh, forgive him, all this, all that, defending him tooth and nail, then when he stands up and admits guilt to the crime, they're still saying, you need to quit picking on the man. Where is your, where is your grace for this man? Where is your humility? After they've even asked for money from believers to support him and to, and to help him pay for his lawyers to defend himself. But he didn't defend himself. He was facing too much proof. Everyone knew he did it. And, and he, he instead pleaded guilty to the crime of, of molesting a young girl. Okay? And so when all this happened, People are still to this day, Bob Gray Sr. being one of them, saying, you know what, th this is the time where we live and where men are pleading guilty to crimes they didn't commit in order to get the plea bargain. It's just, it's just the root of our wicked government. Well, I I'm sorry. Okay, if somebody wants to accuse me of, of tax evasion, if someone wants to accuse me of stealing a car, if someone wants to accuse me of, of you name it, a big long list of, of crimes, and they're like, 90 days in prison, or 90 years in prison, or 90 days if you just admit guilt to tax evasion. If I didn't do it, I might still say I did. Because for the sake of my family, going to prison for life, 
versus for 90 days is a lot different. I would plead guilty to something dumb like tax evasion. If they cross their T's, dot their I's, and they're like, you owe us a penny, you evaded it, you're guilty, I'd say, fine, I'm guilty. I'd do the time for 90 days and have that guilt upon me. Whatever, that's playing the system. They're saying that this guy did that with molesting children, with being a pedophile. They're saying that he just is using the system. Child pedophilia and molestation is something that I will die and rot in a prison for, not accepting that I was guilty of. Amen. I'm never going to stand before a judge if I didn't do the crime and say, oh yeah, absolutely, I did that just to get a plea bargain. There are certain things, and that is one of them, where I would never admit guilt to something that I didn't do. That's they're saying this guy did. And the reason why they're saying that this guy did that is because they went to bat so hard for the man, and then... They're fighting for him. They're saying he didn't do it. They're shaming the victims. They're shaming the victims. They're, they're shaming the preacher that brought it to light. And they're saying he's wicked, he's wrong. They're, they're fighting so hard for this pedophile. And then in the end, he just admits he's guilty. And they're like, oh, he admitted he's guilty. Well, he just did that because they come up with this backstory. And for that, these men deserve to be named. Why? Because Cameron Giovanelli is going to get out of prison in 90 days. He's going to have a probation period of five years. And he's probably going to serve it. He's probably going to serve it at Greg Neal's church. He's probably going to serve it at Bob Gray Sr.'s church. He's probably going to serve it at Alan DeMelli's church, at Jack Treber's church. He'll just go back to one of these churches and continue to do what he's always been doing. You think that he can be placated? Romans 1 says they can't. And anyone who would molest and touch a child and then say, yeah, yeah, I did it, it's wicked. And they deserve to be named. And this is why we name names. This is why we bring them to light. This is why we tell people so that when somebody else down the line is going to one of these churches, glory to God, if they should hear this sermon, hear this message, they would say, hey, didn't my pastor say this Java something or other guy was coming? I heard something about that. He's coming to my church or something. And they look it up and they go, whoa, this is that pervert. This is that molester. This is that. And then they're aware of it. The same as the Apostle Paul said, hey, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. He's going to do it to you. You also should be aware of this. Okay? He experienced the hurt and he let other people know. He knew something and he let other people know. And this is exactly what you need to do when it comes to naming names. This is why they're brought up in the first place. Another one recently, okay? And I probably shouldn't even give this guy the credit of naming his name, but Michael DeGroote, okay? This, this homeless bum weirdo that came in here after I talked to him for months, gave him my time, tried to, tried to encourage him and tried to see things from his side, tried to reach out to him, tried to have a heart for the guy and understand his circumstance. He shows up here and after two days of being in this service, he starts telling me I'm not doing things right. He starts telling me there's things off with my preaching. He starts telling me I need to be more like Pastor Anderson. I need to be more like this and stop doing things. And I said, get out. And that very next day after I told him by email to get out and don't come back until we can sit down, again I gave the guy some grace. I told everybody in this church the situation that here's the deal, he's not allowed here, and everyone said, okay, we agree, that, that's fair. Two weeks later, the guy just shows up out of nowhere, and I have to yell and scream to get the guy out of here, and those who he trudges off, people see him walking back and forth, he's talking to himself, he's talking to his aunt, the guy is Looney Tunes, but I extended as much grace as I possibly could to the point where his, his, his railing, his false accusations, his, his, his just basically walking into a church and saying from day one, day two, that you know better, that's a red flag, just get out. If, if I'm already ha having problems with you, just, just get out. And so we did that. But now here we are many months later, many YouTube accounts later, many comments later. He's plastered himself over all of the YouTube channels, just making these comments about Josh Gander this, Josh Gander that, Josh Gander this. Josh. Isn't anybody going to do anything about Josh Gander and Tron? Isn't everybody going to? Going on and on and on and on and on to the point where finally when someone stands up to defend me in a recent sermon, he actually says, hey, when are we going to meet in person? He feigns that he's going to do violence. He says, hey, um, you know, maybe I'll just show up at your church naming the church. Hey, hey, you guys are provoking me to do violent acts now, okay? So this guy is like Alexander the Coppersmith. He did me much harm, for the most part, I don't even care. Water off a duck's back. But now he's saying that he is going to go to another church and do much harm. I'm going to do what the Bible says, and I'm, I've already let the brother know, and I'm going to let that pastor know. But there's a weirdo coming to your church with the express purpose of doing violence to somebody. That's not going to be allowed. I'll name him by name. 
I will name him by how his appearance is, by how his demeanor is. I'll make sure it's very telling, very specific, how that they'll be able to pick this guy out a mile away. Why? Because that's biblical and that's right. That's what we need to do. We need don't take that offense. If I just take that offense in Matthew 18, I gotta go find this guy in the streets of Toronto and be like, brother, let's just make amends to this. Thing. No, it's garbage. It's beyond that point. Now we need to make the name known so that others aren't harmed down the line. And this is just two examples recently that, that came to mind as I was discussing this. Naming names is biblical, and it puts us in good company, okay? It puts us in the company of Paul and his letters as he, as he is constantly addressing his preachers and, and up-and-coming churches and all those kinds of things with specific names about specific people and the problems that they have done. That's biblical, and we're in good company with the Apostle Paul when we do it. What about John the Baptist when he stood before Herod, naming his sins, naming him personally, pointing him out, and saying, you're in a unlawful marriage with your brother's wife. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He is not specifically needing to say his name because he's facing the guy as he's walking down the street, but you get the point. He's naming the name. He's calling to attention the person that's committed the sin. The next we see Jesus, when the Pharisees came to him and said, hey Jesus, uh, Herod is going to kill you. The Pharisees were, were, were indirectly threatening him, saying, hey, Jesus, the Pharisees are going to kill you. Do you know what he said? He said, you can go tell that fox my ministry is going to continue. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising the dead. People are getting saved. You go tell that fox. And he names the name. Puts And not only that, it gets, it gets better. Jesus himself isn't just naming the name of the sinner. He, he's calling the sinner names, isn't he? And you go tell that fox that this ministry will continue. You go tell that fox that I will die when I'm good and ready. You can't kill me. My ministry will continue. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus did more of the same to those same Pharisees. He said, hey, you hypocrites. Hey, you're full of dead men's bones. You child of hell, fools, blind guides, wedded sepulchers, serpents, brood of vipers, you generation of evildoers. Specific people in a specific form were named for their sins, called names for their sins even. And he, he highlighted them. And, and, and drew attention to them and, and made it known, here are these guys and here's what they're like. They're white and sepulchers. Look at this Pharisee. He looks good on the outside. He looks clean. He looks nice. Just like Cameron Giovanelli, no doubt, did. Look at him. He, 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 he wears the nicest suits. He's always there in the church. So look at this Pharisee, shining, beautiful from the outside, right? But inside there's dead men's bones. There's a rotten stink. There's death. There's hell within that man, okay? And he's highlighting that. That's exactly what Jesus did. This Pharisee in Pacific is, is, is guilty, and these are his sins. He's naming names. Now, the purpose, if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Right before the shorter letters in Galatians, Ephesians. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> the purpose of naming names is to show specifics. It's to bring shame. It's to bring seclusion. It's to bring sanctification. And ultimately, it's to bring salvation. This is the purpose of naming names, okay? Specifics. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, okay? Paul doesn't waste any time getting to the point of the specifics of what's going on, right? He says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. The specifics of the sin, this has to do with like when King David came in with the parable of, of the, the man that, stu, that stole one ewe lamb. And it had to do with how he had taken Bathsheba, destroyed her husband, and had stole, even though he had everything. He had all the sheep. He had all the pastures. And Nathan stood before King David, and he said, Thou art the man. When David said, Death should come upon this man in the parable. Had done these things. He said, Thou art the man. And the specifics were highlighted by the fact that he said, Hey, he took what was not his, even though he had the whole world, right? This was the sin that David did. He said, Yeah, that man should be put to death. And Nathan said, Yeah, we might as well... Might as well get on that knife then, right? You're the man. You did that sin, okay? So the specifics are the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, the how, okay? We don't like dealing with these issues. We don't like dealing with, with the disgusting things that are going on in churches around this world, right? 
and uh, the world at large. But hey, let judgment first begin at the house of God, right? If we're going to call it a house of God, there's a higher standard here. We shouldn't be putting our kids into situations even when they, when they can be tempted and destroyed by the leadership involved in those situations. So the who, the what, the where, the why, the truth comes to light. This is what happens. This is why there's specifics mentioned when it comes to naming names. You need to bring the truths that those people would have in darkness up into the light so that it can be revealed for all to see. Why do we want it to be revealed for all to see? Well, I'm personally sick of the Baptists covering up their sins. Just as much as I'm sick of the pedophile priests in the Catholic Church covering up their sins and then just shipping their guys from here to there to everywhere they continue being wicked. I am sick of that. The truth needs to come out. It needs to be brought to light. Why? Because if the truth comes out of the situation, awareness is made and others might make changes. Right? Other people are reading the story of what happened, and in their churches they are making arrangements so that these scenarios can happen. We're one step of the way. We don't exclude our children into some junior church or some Sunday school where they're at risk of being behind closed doors with anybody but their parents. That's the, that's the model that we have chosen to have our church. Children inclusive. If we hear a little bit of fussing or squawking or running in and out or if a kid comes and hugs my leg while I'm trying to preach, no big deal as long as that child is safe. Right? That's one of the safeguards. That's the thing that has come to be. Why? Because I know who, what, where, when, why, and how certain situations of wickedness have come about. That truth has been brought to light and awareness is made. And so we can make changes to ensure that that doesn't happen again. Bringing up specifics about times and places and those sort of things also allows for, in Cameron G. Finale's case, other people who are at that church to come forward and say, yeah, I was at that church at this time, and I remember this. And this happened to me, and that happened to me. And other people can come forward, and they can shed more light on the scenario. This is why, when you name names specifically, the, uh, the specifics need to come to be. <clears throat> the next thing we want is for shame to come upon the person. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the second portion there. And it says, And such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And statement does two things. The first thing that it does is it, it, talk, it calls a specific person to mind. Because people are like, fornication, okay. That might be going on in the church at Corinth. All right, I understand where Paul's going. Oh, but that one that should have his father's wife. Everyone knows that one. That should, like, he didn't have to name his name. He brought attention to the specifics of the man involved by bringing up the specifics of the sins that he was involved in. And his intent is to bring much shame to the scenario, not only to him, but to those around him, when he says, and such, such fornication is not so much even a name of one of the Gentiles. Once you have his father's wife, he's saying, hey, hey, even, even wicked heathen unbelievers are behaving this ungodly, are doing these, these wicked acts. This sin is not even so much named among the Gentiles. This is so gross that one should have his father's wife. What an awful, awful type of fornication is happening here. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 says, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. The purpose of bringing to attention the specific man, his specific sins, and it was to bring shame. Note that man. Have no company with that man, that he may be ashamed. Seclusion is what is naturally next. When it says, have no company with him, that's a good transition to 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 2. It says, and ye are so puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. They wanted that man out. They wanted him to be, just get out of here. Take him away from you. We need seclusion for this sin and the sinner. We need the shame of you not partaking anything with, not being fellowshiped with him, not coupling with him, noting him, Putting him away, getting him out of here. Why? Because you know the specifics. They've been brought to light. Okay, he's ashamed. Get him out of here. Seclusion was the end goal of this. And it's just like in the case of leprosy. Whenever there was some sort of cancer or disease or ailment upon the flesh, the first thing that they did was they got the person out of here. Even if it's just to give time to find out if it's actually leprosy. You notice how many times that happened in the Bible where they would see a spot on somebody? They would see an accusation like fornication, not so much as named among the 
Gentiles, they would see some sort of glaring sin. They'd say, whoa, get out of here. Almost instantly. Get out of the camp. And then the priest would go, right? The leadership would go and they would address the issue. They'd look at the leprosy and say, oh, it's, it's, it's leprous or it's not. He's clean or he's unclean. And then they would bring him back in or they'd keep him out appropriately. Even still, the first step was to get him out of there. And that's the first step that this church missed. Specifics in naming names, shame is associated with name names, and seclusion is what's the desire of naming names. Get them without the camp to the end that there would be sanctification. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 3. For I verily is absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? He said, I've already judged the scenario. This guy needs to go. This guy is a fornicator. He needs to get out of here. This sin cannot abide in the camp and in the power of God. You need to get it out of here. I pray God that he would, he would be evoked to come and judge this scenario even as I have done. The purpose of that was that there would be sanctification in the end. 1 Timothy 5 and verse um, 20, you don't have to go there. It says, they that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. And that's the purpose of sin. Sin comes into the camp. They're rebuked before all. The purpose is that others will fear. They won't do the same thing. They will know that if they do the same thing, the same fate is going to come upon them. What's that fate? Specifics are going to be named. You're not going to get away with it. You're not going to sin a grievous sin and have nobody ever mention that again. You're, not going, you're going to have to have the shame of bearing that reproach forever and ever and ever and ever. Even if somebody that did something something wicked, I don't believe Calvin Juvenile is the case, but even if somebody did something harmful and wicked that wasn't in that category, fornication being one of them, they could be redeemed and brought back in. They're always going to have that shame upon them. The seclusion happened, they went out, but the purpose is that the whole body would be sanctified. The, the cancer's out. The body is clean. The body is, is ready to move on, continue to do what it's doing. It's doing it free of that sin that's within the camp. <clears throat> Sanctification was the next purpose. And I said, they that sin will be for all that others may fear. It's done before all that they would, they would, there would be judgment. There would be separation practiced within the body. And then there could be cleansing. And after there's cleansing, what is there? Salvation. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 5 says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. What's he saying here? He's like, I'm delivering the fornicator unto Satan. I'm, I'm getting him out of the church body. I'm getting him out of the fellowship. I'm getting him out of the prayer and support from God's believers. And I'm passing him off to the devil. The devil can have his way with him. The devil can do whatsoever he will. Not to the end that he would be destroyed, but that the flesh would be destroyed, that the spirit would be saved in the day of salvation. So in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, that spirit would be saved because his flesh had been chastened. And that's usually what it takes for people to make a wise spiritual decision, unfortunately, is that they need to have their flesh a little destroyed. They need to have, have sufferings in this present world, sufferings in their body, in order for them to get through things right. That would be the ultimate goal. But the salvation isn't just for the sinner, because I'm telling you right now, I, I could give a give a rip about a child molester getting 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 clean, getting saved, getting renewed. Good riddance, bad rubbish, right? You guys are reprobate. Okay? But but the other people that have salvation are either like I said, the fornicator, right? You name the name, you bring the sin to light, they get right in the course of time after they've experienced shame, after they've experienced seclusion, after they've experienced sanctification, they're not born again as in saved like the fornicator, but they're, but they're saved from the fornication. They're saved from the problem that they had, because that's what he's saying here. Deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved, it may be cleansed, it may be washed, it may be made right in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says also, and I believe, that it's others that we need to be worried about. Continuing on in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are also unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. This is saying, hey, your glory in the sinner that you've allowed into your church is not good because that little leaven, you know, if we have a church of like 500 people and there's one fornicator, that little leaven will leaven the whole lump. That yeast will spread. You will have sin throughout the whole body. 
Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. And I'm not just talking about spiritually people being saved. Once the sin is purged out of the camp, once the name has been named, once the specifics are out there, the shame has come upon him, he's removed out. I'm not just talking about the spiritual body being saved, but how about actual physical people from the attacks that would come upon them? Remember, I'm talking about the violent attacker. Remember, I'm also talking about about the perverted molester. Talk about all these people that would do more harm and they could be saved if only we would follow the specific purpose and plan of naming names within a congregation. There is nothing wrong with this. The purpose and the goal is to help the body to perform like the body should. We are supposed to be able to grow one with another. We're supposed to be able to fellowship one with another. Go and soul win and do the labor one with another. But we can't do that if we're full of sin. And somebody that's here that has, you know, one of these one of these Baptist churches that they just allow some some pervert to come in and under the that church can't function right if they are allowing for molesters to come in. Can you imagine the spiritual wickedness that is entering in when they let some some filthy predator just come in through their doors? Just that alone, welcoming him in, it's just like it's just like opening up legions of devils to just come come barging through and destroy lives and to hurt people spiritually and to hurt people physically. No, they ought to be called out. They ought to be named. They ought to be marked and they ought to be avoided Amen. in all cases. That's the purpose and goal. Go to Romans chapter 16. Just a few pages to the left. <clears throat> the purpose and goal of naming names is that we would have a sanctified church free of sins, glaring sins, especially ones named in Corinthians. We're talking about fornication, about railing, about covetousness, and on and on and on. It's also to have a safe church. We're talking physically. We, we don't want to just allow people with these glaring sins to come into our life and start affecting our children and start affecting the weaker members and start affecting just everybody as a whole that that plague and that cancer would be able to continue. So we name the name. We bring shame to that cause. We get them out of here, and then we can start to heal. We can start to cleanse after the fact. We want this church to be full of sanctified and safe believers. Romans chapter 16, verse 1 says, I command unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea, that ye receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she had need of you. For she hath been a succor of many, and of myself also. And he continues, he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, for they have, for, who, have, who have for my life laid down their own necks. Continues on down in verse 5. He says, Salute my well beloved Apatneus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Verse 6. Greet Mary. Verse 7. Salute Andronicus. How about verse 8? And Phylus. And on and on and on. Rufus down there in verse 13. Salute in verse 14. Uh, as sin Christ I could have picked an easier one. How about Julia down in verse 15? He can he's just naming and naming and naming all of the good saints. So there's two sides to this. There, there, there's a sign, I, I, I named Brother Mark's name today, right? I said, good job, buddy. You keep soloing with your dad. Way to go, Mark. I can, I can name Brother Yuri. Good, bro, Brother Yuri helped me by filling in the pulpit a few weeks ago. You know, the Lord reward him according to his Brother Jamie, he's stepping up, and he's doing everything that I ask him, even outside of his comfort zone. The Lord reward him according to There's There's good ways to name names. There's nothing unbiblical about naming names. It's just we always want to shy away from the negative side of things. Hey, there's two sides to the same coin. He's naming the good. He's naming the righteous. He's naming those that have labored with him. He's giving them a salute. Hey, salute. Salute, 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 salute. Salute all of these that have labored with me. And that's what we want. Is we want a church that is full of sanctified, saved, safe believers that don't need to fear attack physically or spiritually. We want to have a place that is safe for church, for church goers, for believers to be. But the reality is, is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness in this world. So we need to be on guard and ready for the attacks that will come. There are spirits at work, and those that are under the influence of them scripturally need to be marked so that we know that we can avoid them, lest they deceive others. Look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, okay, he just started talking about all of the good brethren within the body, all the good ones that he's encountered in the church in Romans. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. 
Now you can take and look at all the good things that they did. And basically, if somebody is not adhering to the good standards that Paul has seen, they have been contrary to the doctrine which has been learned. Well, what are these people learning? They're learning to uh, receive people as becoming saints. They're learning to lay down their life, even their own necks, for other believers. They're learning to labor much. They're learning to bestow labor within the body. They're, they're learning to be fellow prisoners, to yoke up with people in the body. They're learning to give love. They're learning to minister in households. They're learning to labor. Again, it says in the Lord, labor, labor, labor. They labored much in the Lord. I'm looking at verse 2. They're, looking, they're, they're learning all of these things that Timothy was charged later to teach his church there. At Ephesus. And when you see something like verse 17, it says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. He's basically saying, hey, if they're not, if they're not towing the line with, with what is the general spirit of the church, if there is somebody that is contrary to these things, they're contrary to the doctrines, contrary to the teaching, contrary to the direction, they need to be marked and they need to be avoided. Verse 18, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ with their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And so this is why it was important. It was pivotal. It was even just shy of commanded that the leadership and the people that, that, that would be, that, that the body itself would take sin seriously and take sinners instantly the same seriously and they would do so uh, bringing it to light. Lest these would deceive, they need to be marked. But I gotta ask you, how can you mark somebody if you won't name their name? How can you mark somebody if you won't bring specifics? How can you mark somebody if you won't reveal their sins? You could just say, oh, he's a, he's a bad guy. Well, who? <laughs> we, could be, we could just be so general. We, we could just stand up here like most of these, uh, these independent Baptists do and just say, sin is bad, okay? Sin is bad, amen? Bad sin is bad. Sin is bad, don't sin. Right? We can just be general with everything. I knew a guy once and he sinned. Sin is bad. Right? And just, just be so general. No one has a clue what we're talking about. Or you can biblically do what the Apostle Paul has been doing and what I believe by extension he is teaching. To mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. And avoid them. How can we protect people if the people don't even know what they need to be protected from? We just say, hey, there's a wolf in here. And we're all just looking like, oh, it's me? <laughs> well, what, what do we do? What's going on, right? Some of these Baptist preachers, too, they, they've told congregation, this heard about a family, that, that they said, they, they brought to them, hey, did you hear about this, this Cameron Giovanelli thing? This is, this, is, this is wicked that this guy would be in these other churches, that, that a known sexual predator would be allowed free course to the church, to the children, to all the things going on in here. And the preacher looked them straight in the eye and said, yeah, we got one here, too. What? They wouldn't tell who. They wouldn't say what. They wouldn't say where. So they got out of there. <laughs> Mark them. Avoid them. Mark the whole church if that's the case, right? But we're not a church that does that, right? We believe biblically. We, we're commanded if something should happen in that fashion. People need to be marked for their sins and avoided if, if the scripture justifies it so. And we're never going to be harboring some known pedophile to come in here. Are you kidding? That's garbage. And that is why I specifically felt obliged to name Calvary Juvenile, to name Greg Neal, to name Bob Grace Sr., to name Alan Donnelly, to name Jack Treber. These guys are giants in the IFB world. Giants, the biggest churches out there, the most influenced, the Bible colleges, just cranking out preachers that have the same mentality. And they're going to bat for a guy that just pled guilty to molesting an underage child that, that he was overseeing as a pastor. And they're not going to stand against him. So I will stand against him, and I will name him, and I will make sure that everybody in this church knows, hey, if you ever if you ever find yourself in South, you know, Carolina, or California, wherever it is, wherever Treber is, don't go to his church. Why? Because he's probably harboring a pedophile. If you care for your family, if you care for your friend, if you care for yourself, you won't go there. You'll mark it because he won't. He's not going to make it plain. He's not going to make it known. But that's what the Bible says. We need to name names so that, like the Bible says, so that specifics are shown, shame is found, seclusion is made, sanctification comes, and salvation most importantly, when it comes to these reprobate perverts, salvation for the body. They'll just be saved from having to deal with that thing. Having, having peace of mind. Can you imagine going to a church and just, just not even knowing? 
not even knowing the pastor never mentions that kind of stuff. He's not going to stand against some firm. You just don't even know. And most of these churches, they command that you put your children into their special programs. Unless you can't even be a part. Heck no. Not doing it. Right? And just praise the Lord that you got a church like this that won't allow that stuff to happen. Amen.